Thank you so much for those warm words of welcome. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really a, a delight and an honor for me to be here. Um, it's been fun looking at all the different posters. Um, at least one of one is my former student, um, which I guess suggests how old I really am at this point. Uh, I'll probably speak for about 35, 40 minutes. Um, I'll try to keep it to 35, 40 minutes, and then um, I'd welcome any questions that, that you have. So the Central Intelligence Agency is America's most enigmatic institution. Few who were present at its creation in 1947 could have imagined that an agency dedicated to stealth would have become one of the government's most publicly known agencies and the world's most recognizable acronyms. The company has been the subject of countless journalistic accounts, histories and novels, films and television shows. It has its own YouTube site, Facebook page, and Twitter account. As citizens and scholars, therefore, we confront a challenge. How do we discriminate between fact and fiction, rumor and event, legend and history? To address this question, journalists and academics have closely dissected its evolution from the World War II Office of Strategic Services. There is, as a result, little mystery about the why and the how. What remains puzzling is the what. After all, as if overnight, America's only foreign intelligence service, comprised of civilians and independent of any department or agency, acquired the responsibility for conducting covert actions, an assignment far removed from its foundational mission of collecting and analyzing intelligence. Now, covert actions encompass a broad set of black operations, including propaganda, the recruitment of assets, sabotage, assassination, regime change, and everything in between. I shouldn't have mentioned assassination because it's against the law, but it's been part of what we have done. Today, I will focus on the blackest of the black, the CIA's development of a paramilitary capacity. I will also describe how this development evolved at the expense of the agency's ability to collect and analyze intelligence. My argument is that this equation contributed to, if not produced, poorly designed and executed covert projects on the one hand and intelligence failures on the other. To the detriment of America's national interest, the CIA lost its way. My premise is that because the CIA's evolution during the Cold War contravened its designer's original intent, the structural flaws that have undermined its performance are not ingrained in its DNA and impervious to reform. To the contrary, the historical record reveals that a confluence of bureaucratic politics, individual initiatives, and strategic preferences dramatically transformed the CIA's identity and mission. The military perceived a covert capability as a vital supplement to its planning and operations, but a distraction from its focus on fighting a real war. Senior intelligence officials categorized covert operations as aggressive instruments for stealing secrets. And strategists, politicians, and ideologues considered them low-risk methods to roll back the communist tide. That these operations would generate so much blowback in Iran, Guatemala, Syria, Congo, Afghanistan, and a seemingly unending list of other places was not considered because it was not imagined. Nor was it imagined that the attention paid to these operations would make the Directorate of Intelligence the stepchild of the Directorate of Operations, now called the National Clandestine Service. The political scientist Amy Zegard correctly writes that the CIA's architecture was flawed from its birth. 
but she misrepresents the end product when she claims that it was flawed by design. Now, intelligence analysis and covert actions make for a rocky relationship. Great Britain, for example, entered the post-World War II era with MI5, MI6, the Joint Intelligence Committee, and other intelligence services which were divided based on responsibilities. In 1947 America, however, the national security state and the nation's acceptance of its global power were in their infancy. That immaturity, juxtaposed with U.S. history and culture, made creating even one peacetime foreign intelligence agency enormously difficult. Further, other possible sites to situate covert operations, above all the military, resisted accepting them. The result was the ballooning, the ballooning, excuse me, and ultimately the distortion of the CIA. I use these words purposefully. Documentation on the CIA's origin reveals that the rationale for Congress's establishing a civilian foreign intelligence service was to institutionalize a national capability to coordinate, produce, and disseminate current and strategic intelligence. Counterintelligence and collection of foreign intelligence would supplement its core mission. But even the CIA's capacity for collecting foreign intelligence was limited. Congress assumed that that responsibility would remain largely with the military and the foreign service. Remarkably, although in retrospect, understandably, the National Security Act of 1947 devoted but a single brief section to establishing the CIA. But this seminal legislation did include an elastic clause. It stipulated that the agency would perform, and I'll quote from the legislation, such additional services of common concern as the National Security Council determines can be more efficiently accomplished centrally. Truman's intimate advisor, Clark Clifford, later claimed that everyone in Washington understood that this clause granted the CIA license for conducting covert and paramilitary actions. The evidence does not support Clifford's claim. And Lawrence Houston, the CIA's legendary counsel who wrote the legislation, contradicts it. Houston wrote in 1947, not decades later, as Clifford did in his memoir, that there was, quote, no thought in the minds of Congress and the central, that the Central Intelligence Agency under this authority would take positive action for its aversion and sabotage. In the 1963 column published in the Washington Post, Harry Truman sided with Houston. I never had any thought that when I set up the CIA that it would be injected into the peacetime cloak and dagger operations, the former president commented. Yet within a few short years, that's precisely what happened. The question is how and why. The answer lies not with institutional planners and adventurous risk takers, but in the historical circumstances and organizational interests. By the end of 1947, the Soviets had reinvented the Communist International as the common form, and its propaganda assault on the West threatened to score victories in such vital countries as Italy and France. Top officials in the Truman administration identified psychological warfare as the most effective response. But the U.S. lacked a psi war capability, and the military balked at developing one. The CIA seemed a viable alternative. The National Security Council added psi war to the fledgling agency's portfolio. The NSC justified the assignment 
by categorizing these operations as, quote, information activities. But until then, the CIA had not been in this kind of information business, and its officials were neither trained nor skilled in the methods required for waging psychological war. Consequently, in early 1948, the CIA established a special operations group to engage in, quote, measures of information and persuasion in which the originating role of the United States government will always be concealed. Thus was the CIA retroactively authorized to undertake covert actions. But even then, the authorization was carefully circumscribed as insurance against behavior that included the potential for violence. This conservatism reflected the perspectives of key Cold War architects, most notably George Kennan. Kennan, the State Department's Director of Policy Planning, remembered that during World War II, those whom he, he labeled eager beavers from the OSS had jeopardized Allied strategic objectives by acting like cowboys and lone rangers. Nevertheless, Kennan played a pivotal role in bolstering the CIA's capacity and authority to engage in an expanded menu of covert actions, including paramilitary ones. It was probably the worst mistake I ever made in government, Kennan later lamented. The story of Kennan's misadventure speaks volumes about the CIA's subsequent misadventures. He feared that the 1948 communist coup in Czechoslovakia marked the start of an aggressive communist campaign to subvert and destabilize critical U.S. allies. In his judgment, a military buildup would exacerbate Soviet insecurities and trigger further aggression. Kennan therefore proposed that the U.S. supplement its newly acquired capacity for psychological warfare with a capacity for political warfare. He defined the concept, quote, as the logical application of Clausewitz's doctrine in time of peace. Political warfare, Kennan wrote, was the employment of all the means at a nation's command short of war to achieve its national objectives. These means ranged from diplomacy to propaganda to sabotage to assisting resistance movements behind the Iron Curtain. The latter two dimensions were crucial. Kennan advised that the U.S. could no longer draw an unmistakably recognized line between war and peace. Political warfare was the perfect strategic instrument to tackle this ambiguous semi-war to use James Forrestal's term. Kennan drafted a directive to establish an innocuously named Director of Special Studies to oversee this semi-war. Instructively, he charged the Secretary of State with submitting the nomination to the President and, and um, situated this position or the Director in the National Security Council not the CIA. His scheme reflected his changing definition of an expectation for covert actions. The draft defined these types of operations more by what they were not than what they were. A covert action was any behavior that did not precipitate an armed conflict involving recognized military force. It followed that these operations could entail any unrecognized, in other words, paramilitary force. The CIA remained on the sidelines as Kennan's thinking evolved. Its first director, Admiral Roscoe Hillencutter, not exactly a household name in, in, in most American families, had not even wanted the job. But it was his. And he judged Kennan's proposal as seriously misguided. Placing the authority for nominating the head 
of political warfare with the Secretary of State and locating it in the National Security Council, he warned, would create confusion with the CIA's responsibility for conducting psychological warfare, which had been assigned to it. Either the NSA should take over the latter, or the CIA should take charge of the former. Because the CIA already had an established office, Hill and Cutter therefore recommended both missions come under its authority. Now, the agency had already completed its first covert action when Kennan and Hill and Cutter faced off. By channeling money, orchestrating a letter writing campaign, and taking parallel measures, the CIA had helped to engineer the defeat of the pro Soviet Popular Alliance in the April 1948 Italian elections. But this success ironically only reinforced Kennan's convictions and his reservations. He wrote that the close call in Italy showed that the Soviets were escalating a winner-take-all Cold War. In Italy, the West had been fortunate to come out on top. But it better be more prepared, or better prepared, next time. The United States cannot afford in the future, in perhaps more serious political crises, to rely upon improvised covert operations as was done in the Italian elections, Kennan warned. He thus went on to recommend that the NSC strip the CIA of its psychological warfare mission and transfer those responsibilities and the budget that went along with it to a new organization with a broader mandate and dedicated capabilities. This organization, he explained, would be, quote, designed to strengthen and extend current covert operations. And this time, Kennan offered an even more expansive de um, definition of what they would be, a definition which incorporated a variety of violent components. They encompassed, and I'm quoting from his list, sabotage, anti-sabotage, demolition and evacuation measures, subversions against, subversion against hostile states, including assistance to underground resistance movements, guerrillas and refugee liberation groups, and support of indigenous anti-communist elements in countries threatened by the Soviet Union. Kennan's salvo spawned NSC 10-2, the document that scholars universally agree institutionalized the CIA's paramilitary capability and its modern identity. What they overlook at is, is what they overlook is Kennan's effort to strip the CIA of that very capability and therefore alter alter that identity. In my judgment, a strong case can be made that had he succeeded, the CIA, CIA would not only have been, a diff, been different from what we now know it to be, but it would have been more effective. And America's history of paramilitary operations would likewise have been different, and insofar as these operations serve the national interest, also more effective. But history is comprised of many missed opportunities and turning points. The CIA's biography is a case in point. Multiple forces contributed to Kennan's failure. The hasty and reckless evolution of the CIA's capability for covert <laughs> actions and the concomitant degradation of its capacity for analysis. I'll focus on what I consider the two most salient of these forces, or variables. The first, oddly enough, was the perception of the CIA's inadequacies during its first year. As America gravitated toward what historians often refer to as a national security state, 
Truman appointed a committee to assess the CIA's efficacy. To head it up, he appointed Alan Dulles, whose World War II exploits in the OSS had already established him as something of a legend in American intelligence circles, which was actually a very small circle. In addition, his brother, John Foster Dulles, was a linchpin in Truman's efforts to generate bipartisan support for an international agenda. Filling out the committee was William Jackson, a veteran of General Omar Bradley's World War II intelligence staff. See, it's, I got to mention Omar Bradley to the, this group. Um, and also Matthew Correa, a former aide to the recently appointed Secretary of State, of Defense, excuse me, James Forrestal. Although this intelligence survey group, as it was known, did not complete its well-known study until January 1949, it submitted a much less well-known interim report on May 13th of 1948, right in the middle of the debate over the future of the CIA. Dulles, Jackson, and Correa entitled their interim report Relations Between Secret Operations and Secret Intelligence. It underscored two features of intelligence that added traction to Kennan's diagnosis and prescriptions, but turned both of them on their head. First, it maintained that secret operations had to be considered offensive weapons as well as defensive responses. Anticipating the 1950s rhetoric of rollback and liberation, the committee assumed that covert operations would be, quote, directed particularly towards affording encouragement to the freedom-loving elements in those countries which have been overrun by communism and toward combating by covert means the spread of communist influence. These operations had to be controlled by a single agency, lest they lead to, quote, duplication of effort, crossing of wires, and serious risk for chains and agents. That's intelligence speak, but I'm sure that you understand sort of the basics of what they're saying. The second highlighted feature of intelligence all but identified the CIA as that single agency. The report claimed that covert operations and collection of secret intelligence were inseparable. Allied experience in carrying out secret operations and secret intelligence during World War II has pointed up the close relationship of the two activities, the report read. It continued, secret operations provide one of the most important sources of secret intelligence and the information gained from secret intelligence must immediately be put to use in guiding and directing secret operations. This equation portended that the responsibility of both halves of the covert walnut would end up with the CIA. The committee was mistaken. It based its judgment on anecdotal evidence, especially Alan Dulles' own memory of World War II. But Dulles inflated his and the OSS's record of success. Further, there have been many occasions in which the collection of secret intelligence and the conduct of secret operations have been separated, and the agencies accountable for both of them worked effectively in tandem. The example of the raid on bin Laden's compound comes immediately to mind, but it's only the most recent example. Even in 1948, the military provided a viable alternative to the CIA. To envision creating something like today's special operation forces was not much of a reach. Only in the late 1980s, however, did the Department of Defense establish the Special Operations Command. It missed an opportunity decades earlier. The Defense Department missed that opportunity because it forfeited it. 
the second contributor to the process that endowed the CIA with its paramilitary mission. This is not a criticism of the military. Its position was perfectly understandable. The Czech coup generated the so-called war scare of 1948, when General Lucius Clay warned that war could come with, quote, dramatic suddenness. Military, military planners became increasingly concerned that their limited resources and capabilities were already stretched far too thin. Predictably, they reiter reiterated their reluctance to take on the burdens of psychological and political warfare, with paramilitary operations now tied tightly to the latter. A military organization cannot deal with the subtlety of this kind of activity, thundered Defense Secretary Forrestal. I don't want any Army representative to have anything to do with this activity, chimed in Secretary of the Army Kenneth Royal. Had Truman's chief officials been confident in the CIA's capabilities, the hesitation of the military to accept the mission, combined with the recommendation of Alan Dulles's committee, would have closed the case. But they were not confident. In the collective view of the administration, the CIA had not been designed to be a, quote, operating organization and its operatives were inadequately trained in the essential skills. Besides, Helen Cutter was far too conventional to accept Kennan's judgment that the Cold War obscured the boundaries between war and peace. Seeking to placate, if not satisfy, the opposing points of view, he recommended that the CIA retain its responsibility for peacetime covert actions, but not involve itself in subversion, sabotage, guerrilla support, and similar activities. These were acts of war, according to him, and should come under the authority of the Pentagon and Joint Chiefs of Staff. This division of labor, Helen Carter wrote to the NSC, appears to be a most logical one, inasmuch as it is very difficult to believe that we would send in parties to accomplish physical destruction in any phase of the Cold War. Wrong-headed, as Hill and Cutter turned out to be, he had his supporters, including, or maybe especially, within the military. So the NSC drafted a revised directive. It adhered to Kennan's recommendation to set up a dedicated office, but the draft stipulated that because the CIA, quote, provides the legal structure within which all covert activities can be conducted, and because the agency was already charged with executing covert psychological operations, this office would be housed in the CIA. And its head would be nominated by the CIA director, not the Secretary of State, as Kennan had initially proposed. Representatives of state and defense would serve exclusively in an advisory capacity. That this new draft intensified Kennan's opposition. In June, he recommended shutting down the process entirely and starting all over, establishing an office for conducting covert operations was his idea, he reminded his superiors in the Department of State. His aim was, quote, to devise some means by which the government could conduct political warfare as an integral part of its foreign policy. Setting up this new office in the CIA, failing to appreciate America's current state of semi-war, and consigning the State Department to an advisory role does not appear to meet this need and could easily cause embarrassment to this government. It would be better, Kennan concluded, to withdraw the paper completely and for the time being give up the idea of attempting to conduct political warfare altogether. Hill and Cutter seemed prepared to surrender. 
I would suggest, he wrote to the NSC, that since state evidently will not go along with the CIA operating this political warfare thing in any sane or sound manner, we go back to the original concept that state proposed. Let state run, run it and let it have no connection with us at all. To try to keep a makeshift and running order subject to countless restrictions, he predicted, would only lead to continued bickering and argument. The NSC split the difference, as Hill and Cutter undoubtedly predicted that it would. Amending the directive again, the Council returned authority for nominating the director to the Secretary of State. It also added a paragraph directing the CIA to defer to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in all cases when a covert operation included a military component. But it still insisted on locating the office in the CIA. Truman approved the directive, this was NSC 10-2, on June 18th of 1948 a week prior to the first Berlin crisis. Because further delays seemed too risky given the deteriorating global environment, Kennan decided he could live with the imperfect compromise. He could live with it easier after Marshall appointed him the State Department's representative to the office and then nominated Frank Wisner as its head. Kennan had recommended Wisner. He would soon rue that recommendation. An OSS veteran and disciple of its notorious director, Wild Bill Donovan, Wisner immediately set her about to restructure the office in order to increase its influence over covert operations and its autonomy from the Department of State. The result was the CIA dramatically at odds with what its designers, its first directors, and Kennan envisioned. Kennan had gone along with the compromise design on the presumption that state would guide covert operations during peacetime and the military would take over if a war broke out. The CIA would basically provide office space but that was it. A model with such complicated lines of authority was unlikely to prove workable under the most favorable circumstances. For Kennan, the circumstances were anything but favorable. Even as the Berlin crisis seemed to bring the United States close to a direct confrontation with the Soviets, it underscored the gaps in American intelligence. The military turned increasingly to the CIA, the institution responsible for all source intelligence, to fill those gaps. For the CIA, the sources that it could use included members of resistance movements, refugee groups, indigenous anti-communists, and parallel clusters soon linked with liberation and rollback. Wisner exploited these circumstances to expand his authority and his responsibility, renaming the Office of Special Projects the Office of Policy Coordination in order to mask its real mission he divided it into functional groups. One of them he called psychological warfare, which was by then indistinguishable from political warfare. Placed under this umbrella was the CIA's first front office organization, the National Committee for Free Europe, the progenitor of Radio Free Europe. That program has been described by a CIA's in-house history as the agency's, quote, longest running covert campaign. But the other functional groups in Wisner's organizational chart were the game changers. They reflected the paramilitary activities that rapidly came to eclipse the roles and responsibilities for which the CIA 
had been established. These included support for guerrillas, sabotage, demolition, and preventive direct action. To carry them out, Wisner recruited his former colleagues from the OSS. Developing an esprit de corps that OSS veteran, charter member of the Office of Policy Coordination, and future CIA director William Colby described as resembling an order of the Knights Templar, they became the backbone of the company. By this very crooked path, Wisner's antiseptically named Office of Policy Coordination acquired and then expanded its paramilitary capability. Despite the intention of the president, his chief advisors, and Congress, it came to resemble the very OSS that Truman had abolished and virtually everyone in his administration had criticized. Chief among these critics was Walter Bedell Smith, Dwight D. Eisenhower's wartime chief of staff and the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union as the Cold War heated up. Smith succeeded Helen Carter in October 1950, after the CIA had failed to predict the riots that broke out during the Inter-American um, Foreign Ministers Conference in Bogota, um, after the Soviets had successfully um, tested an atomic bomb, and after North Korea had invaded South Korea, all of which, of course, the CIA um, did not predict. Strong-willed and often irascible, Smith was determined to return the CIA to its intended mission. Toward that end, he reorganized the agency's analytic divisions to produce a directorate of intelligence on one hand and an office of national estimates on the other. To staff both, he recruited from universities and elsewhere in the private sector some of America's best minds and most accomplished area experts. Neither unit met Smith's expectations, and a key reason was the continued mushrooming and independence of Wisner's shop. Smith accepted covert actions as a necessary means to acquire otherwise unobtainable intelligence. But in the words of an internal history that the CIA only recently declassified, he was, quote, perplexed if not dumbfounded by the wide-ranging responsibilities of the Office of Policy Coordination. Smith judged Wisner's expansion of the office's activities as producing few benefits compared to its costs. A retired four-star general, he was also convinced that if a paramilitary operation was sufficiently important to undertake, the military should undertake it. Lacking the authority to abolish the OPC, but empowered by the 1949 Central Intelligence Act, Smith announced that he was going to assume tighter control over the office. Then, to better integrate covert action and clandestine collection, which he thought totally legitimate and beneficial, he merged the OPC with the Office of Special Operations. Not to be confused with the Office of Special Projects, the Office of Special Operations was responsible for espionage, and collecting foreign intelligence. The merger, Smith thought, would dilute and therefore mitigate OPC's focus on paramilitary activities. He was wrong. Two phenomena combined to frustrate Smith. The first was his choice of personnel. When Smith merged the Office of Policy Coordination with the Office of Special Operations, he appointed Alan Dulles to head the new entity, which he called the Directorate of Plans. When Dulles subsequently succeeded William Jackson as Smith's principal deputy, the deputy director of CIA, Smith promoted Wisner to succeed 
Helms, um, excuse me, Dulles. But is the director, his deputy, the, direct, the d deputy director of plans, he appointed Richard Helms. While also an OSS veteran, Helms came from the collection-oriented Office of Special Operations. Smith expected him to serve as a check against Wisner's ambitious stewardship. But Dulles was as predisposed toward covert action as was Wisner. Hence, regardless of Smith's expectations for Helms, his appointment, as Dull um, his appointment of Dulles as the agency's deputy director tipped the scales in Wisner's direction. Secondly, the contemporary climate all but assured the supremacy of operations. Initially, the Office of Policy Coordination concentrated on Europe, setting up stay-behind networks to prepare for sabotage and related activities in the event of a Soviet invasion, establishing relations with Soviet and Eastern European emigre groups, and promoting resistance organizations. <coughs> the volume and breadth of these activities spiked with the outbreak of the Korean War in June 1950. Within a short time, a remarkably short time, and with the encouragement of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA or the OPC was engaged in paramilitary activities throughout the Far East, most prominently in Vietnam, Laos, and the Philippines. And by 1952, its reach had extended to Latin America. The scope of these activities required an exponentially expanded covert capacity. So the OPC grew, and Smith's restructuring unintentionally institutionalized that group. The Directorate of Plans in 1952 was almost unrecognizable compared to its ancestor, and the metrics themselves tell an astounding story. OPC personnel totaled 302 in 1949. By 1952, it had swelled to, to close to 3,000, excluding more than 3,000 additional overseas contractors. The office had seven overseas bases in 1949. In 1952, it had 47. During that same period, the budget escalated from under $5 million to over $82 million. Combining all its components, by 1952, clandestine operations accounted for more than half of the CIA's total personnel strength and three-quarters of its total budget allocation. This scale and structure would remain essentially unchanged until after the Vietnam War. The die was cast in 1953, when Alan Dulles replaced Smith as CIA director. That year, the agency orchestrated the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran, and in 1954, it achieved, achieved the same end in Guatemala by bringing down Jacobo Arbenz. These two operations bolstered the confidence of the Eisenhower administration and subsequent administrations in the CIA's paramilitary capabilities, endowing the agency with what one former official called a, quote, legend of invincibility. But that confidence was misplaced, and the legend of invincibility was just that, a legend. By the end of the decade, covert operations to effect, effect regime change in Syria, Congo, Indonesia, and Indonesia had failed, setting the stage for the tragic fiasco at the Bay of Pigs. Many scholars have assessed what happened at the Bay of Pigs, and Richard Bissell, who directed the planning, looms large in all of these assessments. Critics focus on Bissell's deception, his hubris, and to some, his amorality. What they ignore is more fundamental and more representative. The Pentagon historically assigned too few of its personnel to the CIA. 
and compared to theirs, the training CIA personnel received at the farm was never sufficient to undertake a project of the scale and complexity of an amphibious operation to oust Fidel Castro. But Bissell's training was worse than insufficient. Wisner's um, successor as the CIA's deputy director of plans and Alan Dulles's heir apparent, he never received any training whatsoever in paramilitary operations. With a PhD in economics and experience as a Marshall Plan administrator, his expertise was faith-based. He was, to cite the title of a collective bi biography of early CIA heroes, one of America's very best men who dared. These very best men who dared are the models for Jack Bauer, Jack Bryan, Jason Bourne, and other film and television superheroes. But Bissell and the Bay of Pigs are not fictional. They are part of the CIA's history, and they represent what it has evolved to become. The purpose of my talk is not to analyze the pros and cons of covert paramilitary operations. My argument is more limited. It is that the CIA was and is the wrong agency to carry them out. Testifying to a commission set up in the mid-1990s to help guide the CIA into the post-Cold War world, Robert Gates, who until last year was the only CIA director to have previously served the agency as an analyst, recommended that the agency turn over all its, its responsibilities for paramilitary operations to the Department of Defense. Around the same time, Bobby Ray Inman, a former CIA deputy director and one of the titans in America's intelligence history, proposed amputating from the CIA the entire Directorate of Plans, by then renamed the Directorate of Operations, and folding it into a new clandestine service. Neither recommendation gained traction. They ran up against decades of history and culture. Yet, as we have seen, that history and, and culture are contingent. Only by a confluence of phenomena and personalities specific to the late 1940s did the CIA acquire responsibility for these covert projects, after which they took on a life of their own. Not only does the Directorate of Operations, which of course was renamed again after 2004 as the National Clandestine Service, remain king of the Intelligence Hill, but also the intensification since 2008 of the drone campaign is turning the CIA into what one State Department officer has described as, quote, a mini special operations command that purports to be an intelligence agency. This militarization has taken a toll on the agency's analytic capabilities, which has largely escaped public notice. About 20% of the CIA's current analytic workforce concentrates on developing kill lists and locating targets. Shortly before his unexpectedly abrupt resignation, then DCI David Petraeus proposed an expansion of the CIA's drone force. Petraeus had concluded that the existing arrangement, according to which the agency normally employed drones that belonged to the military, was inadequate. Rather than share responsibilities and resources with the Pentagon, Petraeus, who as a general in two wars commanded these responsibilities and their resources, decided that the time had come to enlarge the CIA's ownership of the drone program. Obama appears disinclined to adopt Petraeus's proposal. Ironically, in no small part, his attitude seems to have been influenced by Petraeus's successor, John Brennan, the current director of the CIA. Although Brennan orchestrated the drone campaign as President Obama's special assistant for counterterrorism, 
He advocates a CIA with, quote, more trench coats and less body armor. It goes without saying that he's not opposed to targeted killing, but he is opposed to the CIA doing it. While still working in the West Wing, Brennan recommended leaving, quote, lethal action to its more traditional home in the military, where the law requires greater transparency. This reorganization would increase the program's accountability and allow the CIA to return to the business of collecting and analyzing intelligence. Brennan is among the many CIA veterans who are convinced that the agency's capabilities in these areas have, quote, atrophied during the years of terrorist manhunts. In my judgment, Brennan is sincere in seeking an intelligence service more congruent with what America's Cold Warriors had in mind when they created the CIA in 1947. But achieving that goal will require something even more difficult than divesting the CIA of its drone mission. It will require a cultural change. Many within the agency's workforce, the vast majority of whom joined the agency after 2001, have spent virtually their entire careers focusing, as one informed observer comments, almost exclusively on the work of manhunting and killing. There must be a shift in emphasis, said former CIA director Michael Hayden. A lot of things that pass for analysis right now is really targeting. Devolving responsibility for the drone campaign from the CIA to the military will be essential to this shift in emphasis. According to press reports, Obama supports this transition. But there's very little evidence he has done much in the way of implement implementation. And again, according to press reports, Congress is putting up all sorts of roadblocks. Moreover, if and when Obama proposes this reform, it won't be easy. The military budget is constrained, and the CIA will be loath to give up any of its. And Congress will need to revise Titles 10 and 50 of the US Code a monumental task. And even the successful elimination of the CIA's responsibility for implementing, if not supporting, the drone campaign will not be sufficient. The goal must be a CIA fully committed to what its designers intended, which is the production and the dissemination of all source intelligence analysis, particularly strategic intelligence analysis. This may not be the CIA that the world knows and Hollywood prefers. Nevertheless, as the United States struggles to make sense of and find security and prosperity in a globalized world of fluid boundaries, which is punctuated not only by continuing and emerging threats, but also by opportunities and leverage points, it will be a CIA that best serves America's, and I would argue, the world's interests. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a moment, a few moments for questions. Uh, if everybody could do me a favor, let me Um, I just had one quick question. In your, I guess, paradigm of the CIA's paramilitary, uh, how would you place something like human intelligence gathering and, you know, like running a network or something like that? Well, as I said, that I, um, I distinguish between uh, human intelligence gathering, recruiting in others, and paramilitary activity. It was that relationship that the Dulles Committee said was inseparable. And I was arguing that they can be separated. But I'm certainly not going to tell the CIA to get out of the collection business.
Uh, where would you have, uh, or maybe perhaps you wouldn't, um, political uh, operations, covert operations, meaning plausible denial, everything that goes with it, uh, located, and uh, covert uh, information operations and covert um, diplomatic type operations. Those sorts of things that are not paramilitary operations. Well, I mean, it's, it's a good question, and I wish I had a, a great answer for you. Um, you know, I begin with one thing, is that I think that in the year 2014, the concept of plausible deniability is no longer operative. Um, I actually think the United States should have learned that a long time ago. Um, and by attempting to plausibly deny action, it complicates things worse. Um, there's actually a very good argue, um, article by, it's an old one, by Gregory Treverton a long time ago, making this point that this difference in covert and overt. So um, I wouldn't spend all my time trying to figure out where to locate the covert operations. That's different, as I said, from collecting secret intelligence. Um, but the plausible deniability thing in, in a world of internet and thing just doesn't work very well. So there'd be many fewer. Um, there could be an office in the CIA. There could be a, a separate office. Um, under any circumstances, those who undertook those activities would have to be extremely well trained in how to do it. Um, which is the other problem is that the, you know, at, at, at the farm, not that I know, you know, everything that went on, that's, um, but it is a broad curriculum in which, um, you know, I'm an I'm a academic and broad curriculums can only get you so far. So, excuse me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah I, don't, I don't want to cross any boundaries, so I'm turning to... <laughs> uh, the, the skills that go into the three types of things, other than the military right. things, are very are very common between a case officer who's collecting, a uh, case officer being a, a person who goes right. out and recruits people to do these things, uh, and, and, a, and a person who is conducting political influence. One, one obvious uh, example of that is an agent of influence. You recruit somebody in somebody else's legislature. And, All the skills are exactly the same. So, and in many of these areas, including some of the paramilitary areas, and I'm making a statement, sorry, but I, uh, those skills are important in the paramilitary guys. I know the television loves to have guys with guns like this, but a good paramilitary officer is also a good case officer. It, it, it could very well be. And, and um, you know, I was speaking sort of generally, and I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, and there would be some reorganization. But as I say, the part of the way it evolved was contingent on certain on circumstances, and um, I, th you know, I use the word reform, and I just think whether it be ideas from Gates and Inman or others to develop certain capabilities which would be dedicated in certain areas, and that's certainly different, I think, from um, the type of, of not just paramilitarization, but is entitled the militarization that, that has evolved over time. Chairman, you, you studied the CIA for many decades before you, uh, and wrote about it, taught, taught about it, um, and then you served with ODNI for a period of time. Did that experience in ODNI uh, change your perceptions of what you understood of the CIA before, or, or did it confirm your template to use the, uh, the Intel solution? Um. I don't think it confirmed anything. I mean, part of it is that I honestly think and I'll say that, that um, any academic who studies intelligence the way I did should have an opportunity to, to spend some time there. Um, so I think I developed all sorts of insights and understandings that otherwise I would not, um, as well as developing a, a respect for intelligence analysts particularly that was um, not that I disrespected them, but it, it, it was really quite an experience. Um, but I do think that the issue, the, the tension between analysis and operations, which has always been there, um, that that was reinforced, or at least I was able to observe that in a different 
way and recognize that much more so because I was working at ODNI with, when all the budget which had been ramped up after 2001 began to come down. So there was much more conflict over resources. And as with any other bureaucracy, when that happens, the tensions tend to emerge more, more boldly. Uh, but the struggle of, of, of the, the analysts in many ways, and uh, I had thought about this before, but I think I wouldn't have become so, uh, how do I put it, adamant or resolute in my sort of talking, using a term like that the development of this came at the expense of analysis before I actually saw the cost to analysis. Thank you, Dr. Hinneman. Uh, I'd like to get your view on uh, the evolution of uh, electronic surveillance uh, gathering uh, at, throughout the uh, Cold War, uh, pr probably at the end of the Cold War, from World War or Korean War. Um. Can, can, can you be a little bit more specific? I mean, the view, it did evolve. Uh, well, the uh, evolution uh, in signal and uh, well, photo, photo intelligence. I mean, I, I think actually it, it's, it, the evolution um, manifests and in, 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 in remarkably impressive capability on the part of the United States to apply its technological um, know-how and skills to be able to overcome uh, really an inability. I mean, when we think of that in the 1950s, um, and there's going to be a symposium on this later, but when we're talking about sort of bomber gaps and missile gaps, and Alan Dulles would get in front of the NSC, and he would brief at the beginning, and he'd say, you know what? We don't know anything about the Soviet Union, and yet we're building weapons and we're, we're planning operations and we don't know anything and it really was technology. We were never very good, at least at that point, of recruiting assets. I mean, the one we had, they came to us. We didn't go to them. And, um, you know, much, not nearly as effective as the Soviet Union, but it was through technological means, both signals and, and um, you know, imaging, Im uh, that we were able to overcome a lot of that. And uh, I wrote a thing a long time ago in which I argued that intelligence played much, a much smaller role in the, in the Cold War than I think we would like to say that it did, and certainly the CIA would like to, to say that it did. Um, but I qualified that when it came to do with, with both signals intelligence and, and images in terms of um, arms control, keeping the budget, and I mean, just imagine what it would have been like during that time if we did not have those sort of windows into what the enemy was doing. I'm, I'm a little, um, if you could elucidate a little bit more why you think transferring some of those operations to the military would have um, prevented what you call the operations to the detriment of the U.S. national interest and presumably uh, have certain things to the, to the benefit of both the U.S. and the world. And I'm thinking, for example, the Defense Department under Secretary Rumsfeld did take on some of the types of things that might have been under CIA uh, auspices in previous decades, uh, obviously working with Halabi and and all of those things in Iraq, that was dismal. That was a that was a disaster. So why would transferring covert operations towards the military be better rather than eliminating them altogether? So first of all, I just find is that I I don't think we live in a in a global society in which most Americans would say we should eliminate them altogether. I think there's, there's a use. Secondly, frankly, that is that I would not use 
Donald Rumsfeld is an example for anything, sort of one way, one way or another. And, and, and so when, when Rumsfeld, um, and he didn't acquire capabilities, he built rival capabilities at a different time. It may have been sort of the right thing, but it was definitely for the wrong reasons. Um, and it did not um, improve the capabilities in the way that I think um, they, they, they would have been. So uh, I'm not saying that this is a panacea and that by placing these in the military, um, we're never going to have a problem and, and they will only, always be used wisely and prudently and in the, the best interest. What I will say um, is that that would, to some extent, liberate the intelligence organizations to be intelligence organizations, and that this is what the military is trained on. And what I find remarkable in terms of what I read about the Senate is that when Dianne Feinstein says, we don't want to do this because we don't trust the military to be able to do this well. Um, I mean, to me, that, that a commentary from all sorts of problems, that if the military can't do it, well, but the CIA can. I'm not saying that the CIA should not help in terms of providing intelligence, but this view is that the military is going to sort of, you know, mess it all up, and I just don't see any evidence for that. Um, and I think actually Feinstein's thing is as much sort of bureaucratic politics and doing her own committee than it really has to do with a careful assessment of what it goes on. But I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, ball. I'm just saying that I think there would be value added um, to making these sort of reforms, or at least seriously considering them. We have time for one more question right here. Right, my wife's a big football fan. And every year, I endure the Super Bowl. And over time, I've studied these teams. And essentially, what happens is, if one team has a good idea, the other team, or whoever gets to the Super Bowl next year, kind of incorporates that into their strategy. Now, the biggest Super Bowl that I saw during the uh, Cold War was the CIA and the KGB. So how did the KGB influence the CIA? And l let me make something clear. To me, when I look at the CIA, there's a bureaucracy that's well-developed. And then there are the politicians that float in and float out. And in fact, they might come back. But the bottom line is, is they're kind of a different stratum. So, you know, are you asking to what extent the CIA took plays out of the KGB playbook um, or in terms of organization? Um, I guess I'm looking at the uh, total picture here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the football analogy. So I'm, I'm yeah, the football analogy is, is you're looking into the mirror, and it's really not a mirror, but you're looking at somebody else. Eventually, you may start to mimic that person. How, did any of that happen? Uh, the Cold War is a long period. It was a, it, it was a long period. Um, and... Uh, Again, I mean, part of it is that, you know, I've always believed, whether in terms of, of strategy or intelligence or whatever, that uh, the most effective policies and strategies are those that are most closely congruent with the values of the, the nation state that's involved. Um, and for all the criticism of those in the CAA, I will never argue that the CIA took on the values of the Soviet Union or the KGB. So I think in terms of certain techniques, the playbooks, I mean, clearly they, they sort of studied and tried to learn, you know, different ways. Um, but, you know, we are an open society and, and, and a democracy, and, um, and that affected the way that the CIA behaved. Um, and that was even more true I think after the 1970s and the church committee hearings when congressional oversight, which was never what it, I think it should have been, but it certainly was improved and improved over the 50s and 60s when congressional oversight was about half a dozen very senior senators who were the only ones who knew what was going on. Thank you very much for your talk tonight.
Tom Hendricks if you'll make the presentation. Dr. Emmerman, on behalf of the Army War College, the Army Heritage Education Center, I want to present you a token of our appreciation for a, a, an extremely informative, uh, thoughtful presentation based not only on distinguished scholarship, but uh, distinguished service inside uh, um, the intelligence agencies uh, at a level that is uh, unique. So we've benefited from both. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.